I was with my mother the night she passed from this earth. She was as frail as I have ever seen by the end. Dementia. The doctors caught it a little late. Well, that's what they say. I would have never guessed what they told me. She was the sharpest woman. But I guess the infrequent long-distance telephone calls have a way of fogging up the glass. I noticed she seemed a little slower and forgetful, for sure, but she was damn near 70 years old. I don't know how they tell regular old cognitive decline from a serious disease like this, but the doctors were right. They knew it was going to go south in a hurry, long before I accepted the reality of the situation. I remember seeing her in person for the first time. It was the first occasion I'd been back home in about 15 years then. Life has a way of running away from you. Seeing my mother in that bed for the briefest of moments, I thought there'd been some kind of mistake. That frail frame of decay couldn't be my mother, could it? I called her name as I got up to the side of her bed. There was no response. They told me she hadn't had a single lucid word in a week. I made the trip home knowing it was bad, but the reality hits differently. I had to sit down. I didn't end up leaving that hospital for two days. I was jet lagged and sick from a slurry of unhealthy food and bitter shock. I sipped from a bottle of Gatorade as I watched the floor below, to the left, and to the right of my mother's bed. Her deathbed. Her deathbed. Her deathbed. I slipped asleep right there in the guest chair. I must have slept a while, because it was noon the next day by the time I woke. I wondered how that could be given all of the check-ins the nurses usually run, but who the hell knows. I wouldn't be surprised if they're just waiting for the clock to tick its final ticks. And maybe they're right to. What is there to do? Why bear the suffering as well as the struggle? Some family came and went during the afternoon. Family I hadn't seen in forever. Since childhood. They held a distance between themselves and I, which made me recall hearing of some dramatic rumors that I thought I was too good to visit home many years ago. It was difficult to care. Cousins came and went, aunt and uncle. But by the time we arrived at 10 p.m., we'd be alone the rest of the evening. I had looked her in the eyes only once in the thirty hours I'd been there, and they did not look back. I kept existing there, in that room, waiting for something, waiting for anything that would make sense or make things feel a little less strange in that dark and empty way. I held no true faith it would come. By midnight. I had already been noticing some growing all-around body aches for the previous couple of hours. At one in the morning, I felt like I was going to hurl if I didn't lay down somewhere. In my antsiness, I went on a walk around the facility and found a vending machine that carried energy drinks. It was in an open area accessible to the patients during the day, which seemed like an odd option for a dying elderly man. But I suddenly realized I hadn't had a drop of caffeine, or anything, in well over a day. I considered if I could live off of the drinking fountain for another day, before quickly shoving a five into the machine and grabbing myself that energy drink. Dark cherry flavored. Not bad. By the time I got back into the room, I decided that, despite my delicious find, I really needed to rest my back for the night. So, I grabbed the luggage I had brought with me straight from the airport and gazed up to get a good look at my mother. 
She was the same unrecognizable woman I'd met as I entered this purgatory. I turned away and began for the door, when I suddenly heard my name shouted in a hauntingly gaunt but familiar voice. Jamie? I suddenly dropped what I held in my hands and turned around within an instant. My mother's eyes now open. They locked with mine like steel. I didn't say a word as I slowly walked over to my mother's bedside, trying to control the tremors working their way down and through my limbs. Mom, I said quietly, trying to smile but finding it a struggle. Mom, can you hear me? She was still staring me down as she returned. How could I ever not? How could I ever forget my tree child? She radiated warmth from those long lost eyes. I felt a slight jolt of energy flow through me, and I quickly nicked the chair on the other side of the room and brought it right up to the side of the bed so I could sit face to face with her. Mom, uh, how are you feeling? It was the only thing I could struggle to say. She closed her eyes as if in thought, and when she opened them, there was something different. A slight tension, like she was in thought or some slight distress. Her eyes still with mine, she responded with, you were given to me so many years ago, Jamie. Oh, you were my little sapling. You changed my life with your little life. I could see the strain in her face grow along with her excitement, and I tried to tell her to calm down and relax herself a little. She actually did so, and after a few moments of relative silence... She spoke yet again. I need to tell you about the day I became a mother. I nodded my head and tried my best to relax a little into my chair. My mother looked off towards the moonlit window as her words went on. As you know, I had you when I was 35. I was late to the party, but it wasn't because I had a choice in the matter. All my life I dreamed of motherhood, Jamie. I dreamed of you. But my own mother crushed those dreams when I was still innocent. She told me I would never have a child. Distressed as I was, I fought back, but she assured me that God had crafted me incomplete. That I was not allowed to care for and raise a family. As I grew, I thought she simply wished to hurt me. But then one day through a doctor's visit, her horrible words were proven true. I was born without ovaries. Or, that's what they think. The only thing they know for certain is they aren't there anymore and they haven't been for a substantial amount of time. I always had the dark cloud of my mother's words hanging over me, but now I was no longer able to formulate a comfort. I was lost and destined to be forever alone in this curse of all curses. By my thirties, I had been trying to find my way in this world for far too long to have so little to show for it. I yearned for you so badly, Jamie. I wanted to experience the rite of motherhood with a passion that rivaled the spirit of any woman. But there was nothing to be done. I made a weekly habit of walking the woods near my apartment at the time to get some exercise. I wasn't a woman of motivation, but I found it in me to try at least once a week. It was the fall, 
and the trees were dying back their leaves to all shades of deep reds and browns and vibrant yellows and oranges. I was making my way through my usual route when I looked off to my left to see the most beautiful rose bush I had ever seen. It looked to my eyes about the size of a small car and contained numerous gigantic red flowers. I began making my way over there to investigate the beautiful bush. The smell of those roses, Jamie. I wish you could have experienced it. I probably walked around that bush twenty times admiring the various blooms, and they were spread evenly across all sides of the plant. But eventually, when my excitement began to grow the slightest bit stale, I realized I couldn't tell from which direction I had walked. The sun was setting, and the enormous trees provided substantial shade at the sunniest of times, so I couldn't see very far in any direction. I began to get afraid, but it was just then I heard a distant sound to my left. I looked towards the sound, which sounded like a distant crackling but I couldn't see a thing. Not knowing what to do, I shouted out, Hello? Is anyone there? Immediately, the crackling ceased. Aside from the crickets, silence. I decided to try some more. I wandered off the trail and I'm lost. I just need help to get back. The silence continued. Many moments passed. I looked around in the emptiness as I began to hear my heart pound against my eardrums. But just as I was about to start exploring the area, the distant crackling, now clearly rhythmic, started up again. Still no response, but the distant sound was steady. I decided... The safest bet would be to walk towards the sound. As I got closer, the sound began to sound less like a crackling and more like a knocking, like a quick tapping on wood. And as I arrived to the source of the sound, I struggled to grasp the sight before me. I found myself before a thin little stream sectioned right in the middle of these woods. The stream was no wider than a few feet, and I couldn't imagine its depth would measure to much. And yet, there was a little bridge set across, very skinny, so skinny, I would have to walk one foot in front of the other to make my way across. And yet this wasn't simply a tipped over log. This looked as though it had been fashioned and sanded down into a nice little piece of art. The edges had this repeating swirl tapestry engraved near the top. It was very pretty. It was in the moment of taking this picture in, I discovered the source of the sound I had followed. As I looked at the bridge, I noticed on the side of the land in which I stood, there was a funny little creature turned away from me hard at work hammering away on the side of the bridge. It looked like a man, but this being was no more than a foot tall, and it wore these deep green overalls, and it had on what looked like this purple top hat. It must have sensed my presence, because shortly after noticing the creature, it stopped its work and swung around to look me in the eye. This is when I found its eyes to be much larger in proportion to the rest of its face than you would have expected. Its skin seemed to change colors from a kind of muddy blue to a forest green to a shadowy purple and a slow, pulsing gradient. It was so slow, though, it was hard to notice. He held in his hand what appeared to be a little hammer. Luckily for me in my flabbergasted state, the little fellow spoke first. Ah, 
the help has finally arrived. He spoke in a jolly belt, before jumping up and down from one foot to the other in a little elfin dance. I felt a smile begin to rest itself across my face, but it was still difficult to react. But the little man kept on dancing and making little hollers, so eventually I found it in me to begin to try and make sense of this. Excuse me, sir, but I don't know what you're referring to. I'm lost, and I need to find my way back to this walking trail I was on. Would you happen to know what I'm talking about? The little creature had stopped his hollering to listen to my words, but he never stopped his little hoppity dance. He responded very quickly with, Of course, my dear, but the forest must meet her desire first. He then tossed the little hammer in his hand at my feet. If you could hammer this nail of iron through the side of the bridge and into the ground, the forest will be greatly pleased. And not only that, but I'll fulfill your lifelong desire for a child in the form of two beautiful twin boys. I was examining the hammer while he spoke, but his last words brought my eyes straight back to his how did you know of my desire for a child? The forest knows the hearts of men. He responded instantly. But how do you know? I asked in desperation. Because, my dear, I am the forest. He spoke very seriously. The nail is already embedded in the wood for my fruitless attempts. All that is required for your children to manifest is one swift smack of your strength. The little creature wasn't dancing anymore, just standing there, staring at me with those gigantic little eyes and large smiles strung up on his face. I couldn't see any teeth. His mouth just looked like a big black lemon wedge. The hammer already in my hand, it was difficult to see why I shouldn't. So I walked a few steps closer to the bridge and smacked the iron nail straight into the earth. There was a shockingly loud thwack sound that accompanied the blow, followed immediately by the roaring jolly laughter of my tiny forest friend. You did it, my dear! You completed the task! He jumped a good two feet into the air and tapped his heels together in what I could only describe as elfin ecstasy. On landing, he continued. Now, I'll grab for you the child. You just cover your eyes and close them until I tell you to open. And no peeking, my dear. I dropped the hammer to the ground and covered my eyes. A few moments passed and I heard some scurrying. More moments passed and the strange little sounds continued here or there. I began to get a little uneasy, growing the longer this went on. Eventually, I could no longer help myself and I created the slimmest of cracks between the fingers of my right hand and peered through into the forest. My pupil followed the direction of the shuffling sounds, which led my eye to the largest oak tree in the forest. I could see a little figure popping in and out of view from the foliage twenty feet up the tree, and then I saw this figure disappear into a little hole dug out from the bark by a hummingbird. The shuffling sound ceased. I closed my eyes again. About a minute later, the shuffling returned, and I peeked ever so carefully again to see that shadowy creature crawling out from the hummingbird's hole. I closed my eyes quickly a final time, and just a few moments later, I heard the little man's familiar voice. 
All right. You may open your eyes and claim your prize. As I did so, I found laying before me on the leaf-covered forest floor a small newborn child swaddled up in light blue blankets. I immediately lunged down, swinging him up into my loving arms. I felt an immediate jolt of love flow through me, but my tongue couldn't help but speak out. You spoke of twins. Where is the other child? This was the moment of the first sign. My little forest friend suddenly lost his jolly smile, and his face turned to a fierce grimace. What are you talking about, you foul peasant? Don't you know to be grateful for what is given to you? I was flabbergasted by the sudden shift in tone. No, it's not that, sir. I assure you I'm extremely grateful. I just believe I heard you speak of twins. His rage grew visibly across his face, and his skin began to boil into a deep shade of shimmering red. You leave this place and never return. Your kind is not welcome to the maidens and masters of the trees. Take your gift, as it will be the last you ever receive. Be gone with you. The little man immediately dashed away into the trees as I yelled out after him. Wait, I don't know how to get back to the trail. Where do I go? But the creature was gone. The sun was nearly finished setting for the night, and I was standing in the middle of this cold forest, alone, with my new baby in my arms. But just as my words were finished, a strong wind blew against my face in the direction from whence I came from the rose bushes. I was desperate and out of options, so I took it as a sign of direction and followed. I made it to the rose bush and then continued on in that direction until, sure enough, I was joined back to the walking trail. As I walked home that night, the unreality of everything that occurred swirled through my mind like a tornado. How was I to explain my child? Would anyone ever believe the truth? Is it even possible? Exhaustion pulsed through me, and despite all of the worries that plagued me, by the time I was locking the door to my apartment, I couldn't help but collapse onto the bed right beside my brand new perfect child. I must have fallen asleep instantly, because I don't remember anything else until the sun woke me up from the window at about half past seven. I had lain the child on a blanket I had folded and put beside the mattress I slept upon the floor. So as my eyes greeted the sun, Perhaps you can understand my surprise as I found my newborn child's face just before mine. As my mind adjusted to my eyes, I realized my little baby had rolled out of his swaddled blanket and crawled over onto my mattress and was just in the process of reaching my chest. I giggled to myself as I snatched the child up in my arms, sitting up. But as the child pawed at my chin, I thought about it. How is such a small child capable of such strength to crawl around like that? Children grow quick, I know, but this baby appeared quite fresh. And it was as the baby's hands moved from smacking my chin up to my lips that I noticed something else child had quite a grip. It was hard to not notice as it squeezed my bottom lip hard enough to cause a shooting spike of pain through my jaw. I yanked away instinctively, and as I held my sore flesh I withdrew my hand to find a smear of red across my palm. Looking down to the child's hand, 
I found the child's fingernails much longer than I had noticed, each about an inch long, and many dripping with drops of what I, for the briefest of dumbfounded moments, thought could have been red paint. The next moment occurred in a flash, my son, and I have never been able to fully comprehend the delirium that transpired next. But what I say, I say in the truth of the name of God. As my eyes dashed from my newborn's bloody palms to his eyes, I found his pupils to be slivered as a snake's, the iris thin and a dull orange. Before my instincts could react, I found the child's arms elbow deep down my throat. I fell back onto the bed with a force, thrashing and trying to scream, but only muffled garble escaped my throat. I scratched my nails into the back of this thing in defense, but it was then I discovered the slithery, serpentine nature of its skin. As I tried to claw it out of my mouth, the child writhing deeper, centimeter by centimeter, down my throat. I felt its skin, as though it were a mass of millions of tiny suckers or hands, grip my fingers and actively try and shove them away. It was then I could see how this thing was slithering down into my body. In the midst of the horror, I managed to writhe my way over near the window overlooking the street below. I struggled against the infection as I felt its shoulders enter my mouth, its skin somehow gripping onto my teeth, its tiny forehead pressed up hard against my nose and right cheekbone. As I continued scratching into the demon's back, deep black oil began to flow out of the wounds and cover my hands like I had just stuck them in a bath of rotten gravy. The obsidian oil began to flow in earnest, before it erupted in large squirts like a struggling volcano, splattering three foot long splotches of black ooze across my walls. Around this time, I realized it hadn't made its way much deeper in the last few moments and realized it was struggling to get its head around my nose and into my mouth. It was stuck. In my agony, I clawed my way up against the wall and unlocked the window, grasping the top ledge of the window frame as I collapsed back onto the floor, the window pane collapsing down along with. I knew what I was looking for. I had to wait until the exact moment the child attempted to relax his serpentine skin enough to withdraw his shoulders just enough to wedge his skull right down my throat. And I knew if the child was successful, my last hope would be destroyed right along with. I struggled to lean myself back up against the wall, still trying to claw through the goop as best I could. And then suddenly, I felt him twitch, a relaxing of the grip within the soft tissue of my mouth and throat. It was at this exact moment, I dug my nails as forcefully and as deeply as I could into the flesh of this demon's back, and in one fluid motion, flung the beast straight out of the open window, flinging big blobs of black oil all across my walls and splattering across the sidewalk below. All of this, from the first lunge into my throat to the flinging him out of the window, probably took less than 60 seconds. As I choked and coughed and dry heaved, trying to clear my throat while catching my breath simultaneously, I suddenly heard a loud commotion outside. Leaning up out of the window, I stared down three stories to the surface below. I didn't see anyone around, 
know people, that is. I did, however, find the most horrible sight. That creature, what was supposed to be my beautiful child, was now chest deep down the throat of some stray dog. It looked to be about the size of a German shepherd. But it, like me, was covered nearly head to toe in this strange black slippery ooze. My eyes caught the scene no more than a second before the child had launched itself entirely down the canine's throat, deep into its belly. My eyes were about bugging out of my head as I stared at this dog as it stumbled around the sidewalk. It was behaving very strangely, like it was drunk. It wobble a step or two forward and then stumble down, then try again. But then, on its last collapse, no more than a minute after I caught it in my gaze, the dog began to change. It was subtle at first, like the black ooze covering his fur was just moving or something but I realized it was actually bubbling. And as I watched the black covering bubble and stream and evaporate, it was suddenly evident that the dog was swelling up like a very slow inflating balloon. The black ooze slid and evaporated off along with its fur as its skin swelled to a bloated, bruised purple and black disease twice its size, then three times, and when I'd say it was close to four or five times its original size, it just popped. The dog just poofed, and its guts covered the entire length of sidewalk I could see out the window. Although, considering its guts were also a black oozing slime, anyone who hadn't been there to see it wouldn't know what they're looking at probably think it's just some mess of some sort. Maybe motor oil? Maybe they'll think it's organic off of a rancid stench. Maybe not. The one thing I knew was that no one would ever think that black sludge was a dog. And I knew for an absolute certain no one would ever believe that sick to be a child. It took me hours to get the gunk cleaned off of my floor, and my walls, and my clothes, and myself. I found by the end of the first hour, much of the thinner spots had crusted up into this sickly, dark, off-grain adhesive, solid-looking but highly sticky and viscous to the touch, which made the process all the more difficult. But in a way, it didn't take too long because I was deep in thought the entire time. I was deep in meditation over what had just happened, and how it happened, and why it happened. The ultimates of the situation, the ultimate questions begging for an answer, I knew were far beyond my reach. But certain things were no mystery. For one, that child was not a child. Not a true human child, anyways. For another, that little creature was not only not benevolent, he actually tried to kill me. And for what? For helping him with his bridge? For following his every command? For asking any single question of the child, or why he spoke of twins when he only had one? It made absolutely no sense. And that was it, really. That was why I did what I did next. That was when I made my decision. When I realized that despite no benefit, that thing meant to murder me. And if it was willing to take my life for simply helping him, What's to say what such a creature is capable of in the future? From my closet, 
I grabbed my old grade school backpack I hadn't used in forever, emptied it straight to the floor, and then began filling it with all of the loose newspaper, paper towels, and any junk cardboard I could find. Grabbing two more things as I headed out the door, the sun was beginning to set as I made my way towards the forest. So ill thought out were my actions, I hadn't even thought to throw on socks. I just ran out there in my flip-flops. There was no time to lose. As I found myself at the familiar place I had ventured off the path the day before, I slowed down and began scanning the trees to my left in search of the rose bush. It took me a few minutes, but sure enough, it was there. I waded my way through the branches, and upon reaching the roses, I continued further until I stumbled upon the small stream sporting the new little bridge. I came with purpose, but little preparedness. I assumed I would be met face to face with the same creature that had attempted a fatal trick on me the day previous, but I instead found something of a surprise. As I broke out on the other end of the trees, not only was there no one there, but there was something else. As I gazed up at the large oaks and pines that made up the edge of the forest I had just crested, along with the trees making up the other edge on the other side of the river, I beheld small openings cresting the tops of all of the largest trees, square at the bottom and rounded at the top, like little windows lit up from within as though by fire. It was then I realized that some of the trees contained small little chimneys that bellowed out a steady stream of smoke. I could not have been more relieved or excited. I took in the sight before me for no longer than a few moments before I sprang into action. As another quick precaution, I scanned around myself quickly as I walked slow and steady up to the large oak that evil little creature had fetched that demon child from. Luckily for me, there were already heaps of dry leaves covering the forest floor, and it had not rained in more than a few weeks. I began heaping large handfuls of newspaper and cardboard across the perimeter of the trunk of the tree, and as the last was dumped from my backpack, I took out the bottle of isopropyl alcohol I had packed right along and dumped the entire thing across the forest floor, absolutely soaking the newspapers and cardboard. I then threw the empty plastic bottle into the river. With what I was about to do, a bit of litter would be the least of my ecological sins. The now empty backpack back on my shoulders. I held in my hand the final piece of the puzzle, the book of matches. I used one match to light the pack, which I immediately tossed onto the mass of soaking newspaper, which sparked a huge cloud of flames, engulfing not just the great oak, but many of the surrounding trees instantaneously, in a gigantic cloud of fire. All of this I witnessed in the span of time it took for the matches to leave my fingertips, spin around, and begin running as fast as I could towards the rose bush, towards the trail. By the time I was there and sprinting down out of the forest towards my apartment, along with the crackling of disintegrating trees in my back, I heard what sounded like distant cries, screams. But I didn't stop moving until I got back home. I didn't hear the sound of fire trucks until then, so I was confident no one saw me. And apparently, no one did. My mother closed her eyes for the first time in many minutes, and I just try to keep my jaw from touching the floor. My poor, 
poor mother, I thought. Her illness had eaten away at her mind to the point of bizarre and disturbing fantasies taking over and overriding her true life memories. What a horrible, horrible fate, I thought to myself. I kept silent as I tried to think of how best to respond. It hurt me to see her like this, but I also knew how sensitive a place she was now. I didn't wish to distress her by arguing with her or anything like that. So I just sat, and I thought, and I thought, and I sat. And at some point, my mother began to speak again. They weren't able to put out the fire. Not for a day. By then, half the trail was eaten up, along with probably half of the forest, far as I could tell from the outside. But two days after that fateful night, as I was walking back home, I met the entry to the trail. It was taped up with police tape. I had heard on the news that the authorities were treating this as an arson case. If I was smart, I probably would have kept on walking, but for some reason, I just needed to see. I needed to know. The rose bush was long gone, so I had to make a lot of guesses, though I had the newly flat land on my side as far as navigation is concerned, which certainly came in handy. I tried to see if I could make out the distant river from the trail path, but it was no use. So after a time, I decided to just start walking out there, praying I wouldn't become lost again. It turns out, I wouldn't need to walk more than 30 feet before I could make out the distant river. And when I arrived at the site, a wave of euphoria and satisfaction spread out through my limbs. It was just the most beautiful moment. All of the trees that bore holes and chimneys and served as sanctuary for the sly and dangerous creatures of the forest. Every last one of them had been reduced to nothing more than a charred stump. I smiled in satisfaction. They tried to get me, but I got them. Better luck next time, I thought. But before I was ready to make my leave, I thought I heard something. A little squeaking of some kind, but I just couldn't tell. I began walking around trying to follow the sound which led me to the large charred stump of that great oak. The sound at its loudest. I suddenly realized it was coming from under the stump. Laying my hands upon the burnt wood, I gave it a little shove, and finding it to be quite weak and ready to be unearthed, I shoved with all of my might and overturned the stump. I found a little depression in the earth below which held a small wooden chest looking to be carved out of plain, fresh, unpolished bark. Cresting open the box, the sound suddenly made itself known in its full character. The squeaking I had to investigate was, in fact, the sound of a sobbing infant, an exact carbon copy of the demon child the creature in the forest had bestowed upon me was laying right there before my eyes. But unlike the demon child, this one seemed active. It was crying, like I stated, but it was also moving its arms. The demon child didn't seem to move a muscle until it was ready to make its move, but I just didn't get the same feeling from this child. As I picked up the child and held him to my chest, I couldn't help but to feel the most intense surge of love and emotion I had ever experienced in the entirety of my life, and I knew, Jamie, that you were special. I knew you weren't a trick. 
I knew you were truly destined to be my baby boy. My mother's eyes were locked to mine as she said that final sentence. I'm sure I looked horrified. I couldn't comprehend how she could spin such a tale with such sincerity. How could she believe such an event took place? But, even in my skeptical shock, the thought didn't elude me of how sane she sounded and how, despite the impossibility of the events she described, it all made perfect sense, in a way. Perhaps only in a way, but still. She didn't sound like a mentally gone person, which, given the story she just told, felt important to note. After using every last ounce of willpower to keep myself composed as I held my mother's hand, I quickly whispered, I've got to use the restroom, I'll be right back, before scurrying out of the room, and I took my sweet time in there, absolutely no rush to get back. Ten minutes later, still running the water and staring at myself in the mirror, I was no closer to knowing how to respond to my mom, or what to do. I was lost. Ten more minutes went by. I eventually had to force myself to dry my hands and begin my return to the room. But as I exited the lavatory, I saw two nurses rushing somewhat hurriedly down the hall in the direction of my mother's room. I followed. Turning the corner of the doorframe, there she was, lying in her bed, her eyes closed. A loud tone screeches out in the background from one of the machines. Someone in there said something to the effect of, I'm so sorry. I wandered back to the bathroom. Back at the hotel, I tried to figure out if I was going to hang around for the funeral or if it would be better to just get out of Dodge. I was in a state difficult to describe. Numb, confused, perplexed, shocked, sad, and a little scared. Her death was destined to be horrible, as the loss of any loved one will always be. But with the context she laid before her exit, my brain just couldn't form a coherent thought. It was like I was living in a dream world. Nothing made sense. Was I even awake? I apparently was, because in my sleep that night, I had a dream. A very strange dream. A very, very strange dream. It was one of the kinds that feels realer than real life. The kind that seems to last hours. The kind that feels like it has a message to deliver. That's the kind of dream I'm talking about. I was not a character in the dream, not really. I was purely a voyeur. It was like I was watching a movie, though in this case, it was like I was watching a security camera from the top corner of a room, because my perspective never changed once through the entirety of the vision. It was a small room. There was a single window and a single door, all in the same wall. I could see out of the window a dark night sky. The room was lit in a haze of light and shadow from the source of a few candles placed across the floor. And there was silence. Until I suddenly heard a rattling, followed by a click. And then the door opened. Walking inside was a woman who looked to be a bit younger than middle age, holding a swaddled newborn child. The child was crying desperately and the mother was trying hard to console. She dropped a plastic grocery bag from her opposite arm and fished out a bottle of formula, trying to offer the little baby a drink. It wished to do nothing more than scream. This went on for 
in what felt like an hour. The baby screaming, the mother trying to console. This went on and on until suddenly, seemingly randomly, the child latched onto the bottle and began to suckle. The mother sighed intensely in relief, before I heard her almost whisper, Oh, thank you, Jamie. The mother continued to hold the child in her arms as she sat upright in a little wooden rocking chair in the corner by her window. Eventually, her head rolled back and she seemed to fall asleep. A few moments after she seemed to fall to sleep, the baby suddenly froze, stopping its suckle mid-drink. The rubber nipple slipped from its mouth, and I began to scream silently in horror as I witnessed the newborn's mouth widen to the width of a football. Before this long, skinny, humanoid arm emerged from the child's maw dripping with that same viscous black sludge my mother described. The three-fingered hand rising up, reaching for the mother's face, reaching for the mother's mouth. But it was just then she awoke, saw the sight before her, and in one swift second of action, screamed at the top of her lungs while tossing the child across the room, the black oozing arm right along with it. It splattered a wet black splotch across the wall before hitting the floor. The newborn crawled backwards, the arm out of its mouth curled like a scorpion's tail towards the mother. It was then the mother hurriedly rifled through an indiscernible pile on the ground next to the rocking chair and pulled out what, given what she said next, I assumed to be a Bible. She screamed out, In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, be gone, you foul demon from this sanctuary. She held the book out like a weapon. It was then... The baby froze its crawling march, and something resembling a laughter began to fall from the baby's stuffed open mouth. The voice was deep and gravelly, like that of an unearthly monster, as it spoke. If for me to leave is what you wish, for every dish will make your wish. For, for every plate you bring to date, a single year will be made pure. The humanoid, scorpion-shaped mass of flesh and black ooze continued its frozen position, as the mother, obviously still horrified, slowly made her way up off of the chair and out of my field of view though I heard what sounded like the rattling of silverware. When she returned, she was holding a stack of plates that reached well above her head. She sat them on the floor before the rocking chair and, with the tip of her shoe, scooted it towards the beast. It seemed to grumble and then began to speak. One. Two. Thirty-seven plates, I see. So thirty-seven years of peace you will bring. But be forewarned, my merry earthen maid, that every year is but a subtraction, that every year gained is one year lost, and that at the end of the thirty-seventh year my calling will be heard. Plan readily, act in earnest, for the chaos and anarchy waiting to be unleashed shall be born from the flesh of this womb you call your child. And now the target is no longer for you. Now the hunger of this child will not be satisfied until every last one of you is made like you made the trees. But alas... Though you ingest my warning, you do not taste it. 
You do not understand what I speak. You shake and cower and think while I speak. And you want nothing than for me to simply leave. I tell you for the final time, my dear subject, that for any hope, you must sacrifice the one thing you want more than anything else. You must put an end to your threat while you have the chance. But alas, I confess it true that I would not allow you this opportunity were I not certain you have no capacity for success or even for an attempt at success. But it is up to you what you do with this truth. And as those final words left his lips, I suddenly found myself back in my bed, awake, staring at the ceiling fan spinning furiously above me in this dirty little hotel room. I thought about the dream as I got around that morning. I thought about it as I headed for the airport. I thought about it the whole way home, the whole wait. I thought about it as I drifted to sleep again that night in my bed for the first time in many days. I ran the whole thing through my head about 50 times over the course of the day, but I'd always linger on one detail. 37. Just 37 years of peace. Quite a while, but not long enough, I thought, as I stared at the calendar app on my phone for the 20th time that day. At the date now just three days away. My 38th birthday. Thank you for listening to tonight's episode of Clancy Pasta. It uh, was another tale written exclusively by yours truly. I sincerely and deeply hope you enjoyed the story. If you did, it would go so far if you just followed, if you're listening on a podcasting app, or if you're on YouTube, if you could subscribe. And it helps out so much. Uh, All the support I get on Patreon. So if you can and you would like to, I would really appreciate it. It would mean the world if you would go to patreon.com slash clancypasta. Follow me on Instagram at at clancypasta. And I will see you all very soon. Have sweet dreams, everyone. Cheers. Cheers.